Sex, money, happiness, and death, four pillars of human existence. How do they tie in with uh, business? Sex, Money, Happiness and Death is uh, the latest book by Professor Manfred Kett de Vries, uh, who is the Professor of uh, uh, Leadership Development at, here at INSEAD, and he's also the head of the Global Leadership Center at INSEAD. Manfred Kett de Vries, welcome. Um, obviously, a, a book with such a striking title, Sex, Money, Happiness and Death, uh, and the subtitle is The Quest for Authenticity, raises a number of issues because, uh, of course, money is related to business, happiness might also be related to executive compensation or lifestyle, but sex and death in a book about business and organizational behavior and management seem rather striking. Could you explain the genesis and, and, and the meaning of this title? It's very simple. I, um, since around 80, 90 years, I run a program for senior executive like this. A lot of, many of them are CEOs, called the Challenge of Leadership. And in, it's a year-long program. The first module, they talk about their businesses usually, and the last module, they talk about their grandmothers. So you see the progression, and they start to talk about, after talking about problems with their boss, their chairman, or a merger, what to do after a merger, and things like that, they slowly start to talk about other things which are really meaningful for them. They realize they don't want to be the richest person in the graveyard, so meaning becomes important, and they start to think also about what to leave behind, which comes, brings us to the issue of death. And sexuality, of course, is a very important part of their existence. They, uh, you know, one of the big things they have is what maybe have been good at 20, maybe good at 40, meaning also their partner, most of them are men, actually, although I hope to have, I try to get as many women as possible, but having to do with their couple relationship. And so, Although in the seminar itself, they don't, in the plenary at least, they don't talk about sex really, but it's there. And the sex is a very important uh, driver of our existence. You know, how do we make partner choice? Why do we get divorced? Which thing they also struggle with? You know, they have been divorced, and will they make the same mistake? How to deal with small children? All those kinds of things are interwoven. So. Uh, in the end, and that was really the, the reason I wrote this book, uh, normally, I mean, I've written many books on business and usually talking about leadership style and whatever, but I want to write a book which really talks about on the main issues people deal with. Maybe I should include the power, but there are too many books on power already, so I felt it was so reasonable. So the money part was very simple, in a way. I wrote, an, I once had a senior executive in that program who was running after me in the hall. He was the highest paid person in the company. He eh? must have made millions and millions. He said, Manfred, how much is enough? And I felt it was so bizarre. That was really bizarre. So, so it started me to think about you know, the symbolic meaning of money, the amount of money in his life. And I wrote a little bit about that. And after that, you know, what people fantasize about money and why people, what they do with money. So the whole chapter came out of that. The uh, happiness chapter, uh, this, you know, even Bhutan, you know, they have this uh, national, not national product, but they have the index of happiness. Happiness, of course, is uh, uh, relates also to success. What is success? Uh, success, you can say, is a combination of happiness and usefulness. Coming back to meaning, and so actually, in the end, people look. You know, you know, you know the famous statement. Uh, you know, you don't say you're deaf, but you should spend a more, more you know, another six months at the office. That's what you, what you want. So, what to do? How to get more happiness? And they start to real, and the issue which comes back and back in that situation is it's really relationships. But they also realize when you have a relationship, you probably live longer, according to some studies. But happiness to do is the quality of your relationships. You know, who do you want to be with you? What is the quality of your relationship with your parents, with your, with your spouse, and specifically with your children? And many of them have ignored that. One of the things that you're famous for as, as a, a management uh, and organizational guru is the fact that you try to tie in issues of management with issues of, of psychology, psychotherapy, and so on. And that, I would say, is your trademark. But have you gone too far with this book? In other words, can this book still be considered a book that belongs in the management section of the bookstore? Or have we gone over <laughs> to the uh, self-help uh, and lifestyle section with this book? Actually, it's probably from a uh, com commercial point of view, if you look at the money part, it would probably be better. It would be lifestyle. Uh, but I think uh, what, what's coming back and back again is the search of authenticity. And uh, I mean, we have had some very bad examples of leadership lately. And I was in Davos uh, this, this year. And, and uh, the repetitive theme was authenticity, how to be an authentic leader, not you know, presenting something else in front. And 
uh, I think those issues are really, in, with all the veneer around it, what really is extremely important to every executive. Now, maybe I should have been more subtle and uh, not use the word sex or death or things like that in it. But we, we keep on pushing it away. But let, let me challenge you. You, in your introduction, you're, you're very critical of uh, management and leadership teaching, uh, saying that it's basically a lot of uh, uh, snake oil vendors and, uh, and uh, gurus who, who maybe aren't so deserving uh, because of a lack of relevance. These are your own words. Relevance to real life situations, real life people, that it's all very theoretical and ivory tower type of mentality coming from uh, the, the world of business teaching. How is this book relevant on a day-to-day level for a business leader? No, I like your question because that's one something I've been struggling with. I mean, probably it's in development of my own life. You know, you write articles as a professor, so you hope to become a full professor and things like that. Uh, I deal with uh, people's lives and I listen to stories. That's what I do. And my, if you are a uh, researcher, a medical researcher, you hope that the patient, that you do something for the patient. And there is a tendency, I feel, in business schools that there are two separate streams going on. Meaning on one side you have the people who deal with executives, on the other side there are the people who deal with other academics. And I always felt a business school should have both. I mean, it's not, you know, you said both. And there has been a, a tendency, I feel, of divergence, not convergence. And that was my criticism, and I'm not alone there. Some of the better known names in management have criticized the, the kind of the abstraction of, uh, for example, uh, you know, in business schools, of course, you, you teach the hard skills. That's uh, you know, finance, marketing, technology management, statistics. But that's, when the people who come to me at mid-career, I mean, now you have to look at leadership development as a continuous process, or leader development, leadership development as a continuous process. They don't come for more statistics, more economics. They come and listen. How do I get the best out of my people? How do I run a team? How do I create a, diff create a different culture in my organization? That's where they come from. And I feel that uh, business schools have to be a little bit adjusted in that direction. Otherwise, the consulting firms, the head-hunting firms are taking over. I see it actually happening already. And I think that's a concern of mine. That, uh, and this school, uh, INSEAD, has been known for its, given our cost structure, about the ability to relate to the, our customers. And that is a very, we are not, we, are not an, we don't have a uh, billions of dollars endowment like Harvard has, which can buy anybody. Uh, we don't have state support, so we have to be relevant. And that's something which is, and come back to the authenticity, we have to talk about, not that you have to talk about sex, and you don't have a sex education in class or something <laughs> like that, but you have to deal with, sex really stands for something else than that. It stands for uh, the, some of the most important decisions the MBAs, for example, have to make here, which is career and partner. And so what, what determines partner choice? That's what I really talk about. And those are serious questions. And then people come later, like the people I get are between 40 and 50 usually, in whatever advanced management program, my, my leadership program. They struggle with those questions about partner choice, uh, divorce, separation. They struggle with uh, you know, what the, the meaning of their life. It becomes very empty, an automatic pilot. How can they renew themselves? How can I rejuvenate myself? How can I let go? Can some of these issues be resolved in this book? A again, back to the question of relevance. For example, is there uh, an antithesis, a contradiction between the money part, pursuit of material wealth, and the happiness part? You seem to suggest that there may be some of that contradiction. So uh, at the end of the day, when we're teaching business leaders here today at, uh, at INSEAD, uh, what, what are you going to tell them? Are you going to tell them maybe you have to forego some of that uh, desire for advancement and leadership in exchange for a bit more peace of mind and happiness? No, I want them to ask themselves questions. You know, many of my business leaders I engage in. I, at one point, person at the moment said 99.9% .9 are spent at work. And good luck, you know. I mean, is this a life? Is that a diversification? I mean, uh, I want people to have a life. And uh, I want them to think about their life and make certain decisions before it's too late. So what I do, this is not a self-help book that, you know, you do this, 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 I get totally, I mean, I find this totally useless personally, but it's my, this, uh, too many, uh, I mean, maybe you a self-help book to find out what self-help you need. That's, I think, maybe the ultimate self-help book. No, this is a book which asks questions. Questions about, you know, what I am running for, what am I running to? Why am I so engaged in this manic defense? 
What do I expect out of life? What makes for a good relationship? That's what I'm interested in. Those are the questions which I raise there and start people to think. And it creates tipping points. I mean, I look at my own seminar. I, I'm, the two seminars I'm responsible for have oomph, I say that, because something happens. Too many times you have seminars, people come out, you know, doing them a glorious feeling, but then I go on automatic pilot. I want them to do something with their life and create some tipping points. And that's, I think, the two seminars I'm responsible for here at the school do that very much. So people start to think, this kind of incubation state, and slowly they start to practice some of this other behavior. They may re-establish their relationship with their spouse, they might have another look at money, their needs need, a Buddha, of course, being the person who has no needs, so you have no, not dependent on money. They may also think about, uh, if you're somewhere like a Woody Allen movie, you know, somewhere in the sky, and you, you look at your own funeral, what do you want people to say about you? You know, those kinds of things, that you start to think a little bit about what, and don't just push it away all the time, because it's going to happen, 100% probability of death, I believe. There's something quite tragic underlying what you're saying is that you're seeing a lot of executives who are advanced in their careers and yet based on what you're suggesting they seem to be not happy not fulfilled or questing for something more what what happened to that brand of entrepreneur who precisely is so fulfilled by the creation of his own company or running a multinational that that is a, a form of happiness in itself which uh, which suggests uh, spending 99.9% .9 of their time at work. But if that's 99.9% .9 of fulfilling and happy time, then where's the problem? Or do you think that just never happens? No, you, I think uh, one lesson you learn from this book is carpe diem. That you, uh, you know, ask yourself every day, was it worth it? And I think too many people say, I'm going to do it next week, next year. Start to think more on that. What I've done this today, what really was worthwhile? And uh, I think entrepreneurs might be, I mean, happiness actually like this butterfly which jumps. And I say actually, and I picked that up in this book, it's a saying, I think in, it's a Chinese saying, happiness is something to do, someone to love, and something to hope for. Although somebody else said happiness is good health and a bad memory. But that's not, I think, the answer. So uh, you, you have, people have to become more aware of their mortality also in this respect. So it's probably a tragic side. It's you know, the tragic transience of people. And uh, you start to realize that probably more than you get older, you're immortal under, under 35. So, but the people I'm getting, also those glorious entrepreneurs you talk about, they might have a moment of happiness, but many of them, in my experience, and because I studied entrepreneurs all my life, become very self-destructive. For those who think that the career will be the door to something else that they'll be able to accomplish later once they've uh, attained material wealth, as you say, carpe diem, don't wait until later on. And, and diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's, I think, a very important thing. You know, own your own life because too many people are on the treadmill. Manfred Kettevries, thank you very much. Thank you.